Boho, so they will have okay. access to it. Um, so, of course, we uh, have Abriel tonight, so we're going to begin shortly. So a couple of housekeeping, like I said, um, everyone will be muted during the presentation and questions will be welcome in the chat. Um, for your privacy, please note this uh, webinar is being recorded. And we uh, appreciate the support of our members with Lupus Ontario. We value your safe and when you come to our webinars, we like to um, know that you are in a safe environment. So we will do our utmost to protect your privacy at, um, at all times. And just to let you know, Lupus Ontario is again um, updated our security features to make sure our webinars is safe for our members. So tonight I have with us Abigail Cook. And I'm going to do the introduction now. So Abriel is a registered occupational therapist. She works and operates RISE Occupational Therapy, a practice focus and symptom management and life coaching for people with chronic illness. Abriel also works in patient rehabilitation at Blue Water Health located in Sarnia, Ontario. So without further ado, Abriel, please, you can take over now. Thank you for the introduction, Sandra. You're welcome. So um, today, we're going to talk about how to fight fatigue um, using energy management uh, to help live well with lupus. So I'm going to start by talking about um, lupus and fatigue, and then I'm going to get into the general principles of energy management, and then specifically the four P's, and then I'm going to talk a bit about the spoon theory. So um, not everybody knows what occupational therapy is, so I thought I'd give a little overview. Um, it's actually OT month, so it worked out well that this webinar could be in October. <laughs> So an occupation is anything that somebody does to occupy their time. So this can be something like um, self-care, productivity, or something that people do in their leisure. So they uh, OT services enable people to engage in activities that are meaningful to them. So this can be in a variety of interventions, um, including helping the person themselves to work on um, different things in their lives, as well as changing and modifying a task. So like say an occupation, making modifications to their work or their volunteer, as well as changing their environment. So their physical environment, as well as um, their social environment and their supports. So OTs work in a very broad um, spe spectrum of practice. So um, we, we graduate as generalists, and then um, there's different areas of practice in physical and mental health, as well as treating clients uh, across the lifespan. So fatigue and lupus ties really well with OT because up to 90% of individuals living with lupus report fatigue to be their most difficult symptom and the one that most impacts their quality of life. So this is um, a very complex and um, there's many factors that influence fatigue in lupus um, because, and, and the definition is also very contested in the literature, but one that I found that I re resonated with me was an uncommon, abnormal or extreme whole bodily tiredness, disproportionate or unrelated to activity or exertion. So it's not just being tired, like everybody's tired. It's um, that physical as well as mental um, fatigue that really kind of uh, impacts people living with lupus. So um, this can be caused due to disease activity, as well as um, comorbid conditions that go along with lupus, like depression, fibromyalgia, 
and any, any number of other factors that is very relevant to the person and their own diagnosis. So fatigue, uh, it has a substantial impact on people's uh, ability to perform um, their activities, even their daily activities, like uh, getting washed, getting dressed, um, getting ready for the day, putting on makeup, if that's something that they do. Uh, it impacts um, their ability to meaningfully engage in household tasks, parenting or caregiving roles, um, how they do at work as well as, or school if, if they're not yet working. Um, and it, it can also impact like your social life and your, your hobbies and your leisure activities, as well as mental health. I think that um, especially when you're limited physically and mentally due to fatigue, um, it can really, a lot of those other factors really impact your quality of life. So I, I personally live with lupus and for me, fatigue is something that most impacts my quality of life. Um, and as an occupational therapist, I found there was um, kind of a gap in health services for people living with lupus and not enough awareness um, around this. So I thought that um, this would be a good topic to kind of share how OT can address this symptom to, to improve self-management. So one of the strategies that um, you can use is something that's called energy management. So this is an intervention that's based in evidence. It can be used for um, many different kinds of conditions, but uh, there is research for it in lupus specifically. Um, and basically it's the idea of um, kind of balancing rest and energy expenditure. So kind of like keeping that, that healthy balance, which is always easier said than done. Um, so it, it's maybe adapting the way that you carry out activities um, to overall improve your quality of life. It's, it's also referred to as um, energy conservation, if you're more familiar with that term. So there's kind of four overarching categories that kind of sum up energy management because it is quite broad. Um, so I like to call them the four Ps. So there's prioritizing. So a kind of the idea of beginning with the most important thing. Planning, so planning tasks beforehand, which I'll get into more in depth for all of these things. The idea of pacing, so taking rest breaks when you need to, as well as positioning, so um, using good body mechanics and things like that. So I'm first gonna talk about planning. So uh, one, there's this can be very broad, but um, planning to do things when you have the most energy. So this will be different for everyone. So that's why energy conservation or energy management is, is a self-management strategy because different things work best for different people. So if, if you plan to do something when you have the most energy, sometimes that's right when you first wake up. If you're really sore first thing in the morning, maybe that's um, a little bit later in the day. Um, whatever works best for you when you feel you have the most energy. Uh, something else that we're planning can help is setting up everything you need to um, complete an activity before starting. For example, if you're going to make yourself dinner, um, instead of kind of doing many trips from the counter to the fridge and up into the cabinets, get the recipe out beforehand, figure out all the supplies and get everything set up on the counter in one spot so that you can kind of be more efficient to, to get everything done that way. Or if you were going to, if it was really meaningful for you to rake your leaves, um, make sure you have everything kind of all organized in one place before you get started. So you have the most energy to give to the activity that's most important to you. So another way you can plan is to alternate heavy and light tasks. So for example, um, if you have to um, engage in a volunteering activity or you have something that's going to be um, very energy expensive, so use up more gas in your tank. Um, make sure that you're not booking activities like that back to back. So you want to kind of schedule yourself to maybe have a break um, and do something light, like maybe you have to answer some text messages or um, you want to watch a TV show, kind of breaking up your day to try to get that balance between working heavy and light, okay? Another part of planning is asking for help, which is something uh, that's not always easy to do, but 
if you know that you're going to have a physically heavy task, for example, um, like say you have to move some furniture or you're expecting to go grocery shopping and it's difficult for you to carry your groceries, asking somebody to come with you to maybe help lighten the load quite literally so that they can help you um, do those tasks so it's not as exhausting for you. Um, and different ways to plan and organize. You can use a schedule. Some people like to do lists. Um, just whatever works best for you. Uh, another thing you should plan is to try to get a good night's sleep because although fatigue isn't just based on the amount that you sleep, and sometimes you can sleep and wake up still fatigued, um, some good sleep hygiene and getting a good night's sleep as best as you can um, is an also, another important piece of this um, puzzle. So the next key is positioning, um, which also includes posture. So when you can, you wanna to try to sit for tasks. So some people, this just comes naturally. You're, you're like, oh, I'll just sit down. I'm really tired. But sometimes you can incorporate sitting into things that you aren't so used to sitting for. So for example, if, if you are making a meal, um, you actually use 25% less energy when you're sitting to complete a task rather than standing, even though it's just standing in one spot. So you can save kind of those efficiencies whenever you can um, by doing things like that. So you wanna try to also minimize bending and reaching. So one thing you can do is keep frequently used items within reach. So this is where an, a modification you can make to your environment. So um, if say you spend a lot of time um, in the couch, on your couch or in your bed, if you keep things near you um, so that you don't have to go all the way far across your house to get the things that you need the most frequently, that is some way that you can keep things between within reach. Or I like to think about, um, there's a rule from your, the shoulder to hip rule of thumb. So in your house in general, if you can, you wanna try to keep things at sh between your shoulder level and your hips. So you're not spending a lot of energy reaching up high to get things off of like high cupboards or shelves or bending down low because then your muscles have to work harder. Um, even again, it's just optimizing your environment to help yourself save energy. And these may seem like silly things, but when, when you really analyze your own space, you'd be surprised how many little efficiencies you can incorporate to manage your fatigue as a whole. So position, um, again, body posture seems silly, but when you, when you try to keep good posture, you can kind of prevent some um, aches and pains and things like that um, when you're sitting and standing. Um, and, and if you do have to engage in something that's more physical, um, you wanna try to keep your arms more close to your body when you're carrying heavy things. So um, even like groceries, Maybe it's not holding them down in your hands like the typical way. Maybe it's kind of hugging it against your body. And that's actually, you, you can engage more muscles. Um, it seems silly, but every little bit helps. So another one is prioritizing. So um, basically, if, if you have one thing that really needs to happen in your day, Kind of working the other activities and the tasks that you need to do around that activity. For example, you have a doctor's appointment with a specialist and you can't miss it. And you know that's going to take a lot of effort and energy to, to get there and to, to go through it and get home. Um, make sure that you don't um, spend time unloading your dishwasher before you go and, and tire yourself out with little tasks so that you can save your energy for the most important thing. And Worst case, you can unload your dishwasher after you have a nap or tomorrow. Another one is pacing. So this personally is something that I struggle with, um, listening to your body. So sometimes we know um, when we're having symptoms um, and that we can start to feel the fatigue before it really becomes um, more severe where it's impacting our, our ability to function, um, try to get those warning signals from your body. And if you need to take a rest, make sure you try to rest before you feel tired, which is really hard if you feel tired all the time. And that is a reality for a lot of people living with lupus. But um, we want to try to regulate that and tune in with yourself as much as you can. 
So resting often, um, although you know naps and rests um, are, are helpful, um, it doesn't just mean sleeping. It can also mean sitting in a more comfortable position or adjusting yourself, maybe taking um, a mental break if you're if you're uh, finding your, your brain fog or your cognitive symptoms are impacting your ability to do things. Maybe it's listening to an audiobook, taking some time away from the screen. Um, you know, everybody has different ways that they find are restful. So you can kind of think about what works best for you. And also pacing um, means maintaining a, a slow and a steady pace. So sometimes when um, you don't, I, I'm notorious for this, not giving myself enough time to do things. So then I get rushed and I get stressed and the pressure of, you know, forgetting things. And then you're running back and forth because you walk through a doorway and you forget everything you needed in the other room or why you went in there. Um, so just, you know, try to slow it down so that you can just give yourself the time you need to, to be present in whatever you're doing. And again, asking for help. So knowing, knowing your limitations is really important. So one thing that um, I found to be very helpful is something called the spoon theory. So this is a kind of a pacing strategy that is a, a beautiful analogy. Um, and it just is so helpful to help kind of give this a more practical application to your daily life. So there is a woman named Christine Miserando, and she is an individual who lives with lupus. And she um, coined this um, theory that she came up with um, about comparing spoons to energy. And this quote kind of really captures um, something that people with chronic illness can really relate to. So um, the difference between being sick and being healthy is having to make choices or to consciously think about the things when the rest of the world doesn't have to. The healthy have the luxury of a life without choices, a gift most people take for granted. Most people start the day with unlimited amount of possibilities and energy to do whatever they desire, especially young people. And for the most part, they don't need to worry about the effects of their actions. So um, if, you, if you look up spoon theory, this is, this is who kind of came up with it. So um, I've created a diagram based on some of the principles that she talked about um, and also just kind of a way that I thought would be practical for um, this talk. So if you only had 12 spoons, like physically, tangibly holding spoons, um, how would you spend them? Because when she was explaining um, this theory to her friend, um, it was also about the idea of loss. So when you take away a spoon, um, it's that idea of like, you've now lost that energy for the rest of your day. So some things in, in our day, they only take one spoon. So if you, know, if you make a coffee in the morning or maybe taking your medication, spending time on your phone, things like that. And some things take more energy. So maybe you know, having a shower um, or cleaning your dishes. And then other things take even more. So going to a doctor's appointment, going out and socializing. Um, and then for some of the things that maybe we, we have to do in a day. So maybe you have, you're a caregiver and you have children or you have pets. Um, that is energy expensive, um, or it requires more spoons, or you have to go to work, or you have to go to school. Um, it's about kind of organizing the, the spoons that you have in the day. So if you, if you have to go to work, for example, um, maybe you don't socialize that same day. So maybe you save that other expensive spoon, expensive activity for the next day so that you aren't um, doing too many heavy tasks in one day, because it's important to realize that it's not just about um, being physically heavy and physically active, but also the cognitive energy that it takes to do a lot of these things, like um, responding to email or driving or the emotional stress. If you have a really important doctor's appointment, not only do you have to get yourself there, you also have to, you know, experience it. Um, and that can be, that can be ex expensive, spoon expensive, okay? Um, so there's also some ways um, where if we have to choose between activities, we can save our spoons. 
So for example, um, if you were going to go for a drive, but you need to save your spoons for other activities in your day, maybe if you can, you catch a ride. So then instead of the three spoons, you just spend the one. Maybe somebody else can drive you or you can take public transportation. Same thing, if, if you have to make a meal and you're just, your symptoms are really not great that day and you're just feeling like everything is costing more energy, that's when you could you know, get delivery and then that saves you some spoons. So unfortunately, we are in the place where we have to make these choices between little mundane things. Um, but it's about, you know, planning and prioritizing. So again, maybe you really wanted to exercise, but you also had to go to work. And so you had to work. So then maybe your exercise is just stretching. And then you're still getting some physical benefit. Maybe it's still helping alleviate symptoms, um, but it's not costing you as many spoons. And instead of socializing, maybe you can talk on the phone. So these are just general examples, but you can try to apply these principles to your daily life. Um, and I think it's important to also acknowledge that the, the 12 spoons is kind of a guideline, but sometimes if you're in a flare, maybe you don't have 12 spoons that day, you only have six spoons. So you have to be even more careful with the choices that you're making about how you're gonna execute that task. Um, and one important thing to do is to remember that you actually have 13 spoons. You just always want to keep a spare in your pocket because you never know when you're going to need it. But it's that idea of planning and pacing, always planning ahead. So um, I hope that this self-management strategy can hopefully be something that you can incorporate into your own life. Um, because some ways to manage fatigue, um, despite the cause, um, can be planning your day, setting up your environment, not just your physical environment, but also, um, you know, if you have supports from friends or family, um, taking breaks frequently, and prioritizing what's most important. Uh, and most importantly, listen to your body. So, um, it's, it's important to meet yourself where you're at each day. And something that I like to tell myself is give yourself the grace and the space to be with your body, because it's always easier for, I mean, to take care of other people and it's, it's, we're always hardest on ourselves. So it is not your fault that you are, you are fatigued. It is frustrating, but it is something um, that you should you shouldn't blame yourself for. It's not your fault that you have lupus, um, and it's frustrating that you have to live differently. Um, but try to make sure you um, practice self care in that way. So um, yeah, I'm open to any questions now. That there in my path. Okay, Abrielle, thank you so much. That is so. Um, interested. Uh, I mean, I love that spoon theory, therapy, the theory that you use. Um, and uh, thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation. And we have lots of, some are just comments, some are questions. So we will get to the chat in a moment. Um, but I just wanted to mention to everyone, um, we're going to try something a little bit different next month. Uh, instead of our mid-month webinar that we normally have, we are going to be having an information session. And uh, Abriel actually mentioned, um, you know, with, uh, with all the different um, things we have to do constantly. So um, for uh, November, we will be doing a information panel discussion. And uh, many, of our, many of our members are living with multiple autoimmune conditions. Lupus Ontario, in collaboration with the Trojan Society, Arthritis Society, the Raynards Association of America, and Fibromyalgia London, will be hosting an information session to introduce um, those other support uh, systems to our members. Each panelist 
will introduce their organization and discuss what support, resources, and activities they offer and how our members can get involved. So again, um, that will be a different format uh, we're gonna be using for next month. Please follow us on social media as well as the website. Um, the information will be um, posted in the next couple of days, and then you'll be able to register for that. But that is something that um, we're hoping um, a lot of you will come out again because of uh, uh, the, um, the, the organizations that we have come in and the fact that most of us who does have lupus also have one of these other um, autoimmune condition. So I just wanted to, uh, while we had so many on this platform, I wanted to let you know. So uh, please, um, like I said, um, LopezOntario.org will be having all the information regarding that information session that will be coming up. So again, thank you, Abriel. Uh, so today we have with us Rapinda and Joy uh, from the Support and Education Committee. And uh, they're gonna be going, they're probably gonna have to backtrack a little bit because I know in, uh, information has been coming all along. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask Rapinda uh, to begin. Um, and then Joy will do the next question and so and so forth. Okay, so Rapinda, would you like to address the first sure. question or comments? Sure. Well, the first, it's a comment and a question. So one of our, um, uh, our participants has mentioned that in some of the work, uh, a different workshop she went to on fatigue management, there were strategies mentioned that come with quite a cost. And she was wondering if, if you were gonna address that. And um, I know that the, the strategies that were mentioned today don't come at a cost, but did you want to mention anything around that, Abriel? Sure, um, so I think um, there, the, it depends, I guess, um, the personalization of like fatigue management. So um, for example, like in my private practice, um, I'm just kind of getting started, but I, I'm planning to do some different options where you can have like personalized intervention focused around like general health, not just fatigue management, um, as well as maybe some, some group sessions or some um, course material where it's kind of easier to access that information at a lower cost. Um, that's just me personally. Um, as a therapist at the hospital, however, I work for the government indirectly. So OHIP covers all of my interventions. So I also go over energy management strategies and most occupational therapists do, um, it's, it's like a foundational kind of tool in our toolbox across um, health care. Um, and I think there's also ways of accessing um, fatigue management through different pain clinics, which you can also get covered by OHIP. Um, if you look up like locally, sometimes occupational therapists or social workers um, can kind of help with that. But it, it depends really what the root of your, your fatigue is. So um, as I was saying, it, it can be you know, just purely lupus or often a lot of us, some of us have other conditions as well that kind of lead to it. So it, it's hard to pinpoint where exactly it's coming from. And there are some other free services. So like arthritis, the arthritis society, you can self-refer and they, most of them have uh, occupational therapists who, and social workers and, and physiotherapists who can help um, with this um, kind of symptom management as well. So it's, it, there is a, a variety of opportunities um, in terms of cost. And some people, if you have benefits or coverage, um, or uh, I think even some ODSP um, providers or like applicants, um, if you get a referral from your physician, um, occupational therapy can be covered by the government. That's all. Thank you. Um, okay, so why do many rheumatologists not really recognize or acknowledge fatigue? Uh, that's a tricky question. So um, I think that the difficulty is within the scope of rheumatology, uh, as a physician, uh, they have limited 
time with patients. Um, and so I think in the medical model, um, there's not, there's no magic pill um, that can kind of handle fatigue, um, although it's often related and most detrimental. Um, I know that when I first got diagnosed, that was like what I was hoping my rheumatologist would help me with. I'm like, I'll take the joint pain. I will take all the symptoms. Just please help me to participate in my life. Um, but I think that's where like allied health, like occupational therapists um, can kind of help to fill that gap. Um, and maybe it's even, and just because that's, we can take that time to really get into the lifestyle changes. Whereas rheumatologists often, they look at the blood work and they look at, um, you know, medication management. And that's kind of, if you're, if you're like, okay, on paper, that's kind of where they say, okay, make some lifestyle changes. And then they don't always have the time to like really delve into that. Um, some are better than others using integrated medicine and things like that. But um, yeah, I, I can't really speak to that, unfortunately. I know some, a lot of people I've talked to have had some really bad experiences with. Okay. With that. So the next question, um, I hope I didn't skip any questions. There were a lot of comments, wonderful comments. But the next question I see here is um, one of our participants asked, on the spoons theory, is there an approach you'll cover for replenishing? So you don't always have to give away spoon supply metaphorically and figuratively speaking. Uh, yes, uh, there are, sometimes there are ways to kind of replenish um, such, such as rest. Um, like sometimes rest can be restful enough that you have the energy to kind of participate, but that's kind of where you just need to listen to your body. So maybe you took a nap and you feel refreshed when you woke up, um, but it's, it's about kind of pacing yourself through that. So uh, sometimes people can nap and they don't feel better. It kind of depends on your body and what works best for you. Um, but rest can replenish your spoons, so to speak, especially like a good night's sleep the idea is that the next day you kind of reset and 12 is just kind of a guideline. Like if you are um, in remission or your symptoms are pretty well managed, um, you might have more spoons to spend. So th that idea of rest and taking breaks, it makes things um, less energy expensive, I guess. Thank you. So the next question for medications that require measuring, are there any tips to make it easier? So counting clicks on an injection pen when I cannot see the dial takes a lot of energy. It's the same with inhalers. Yes. Um, so in terms of things like that, um, you could use something like there are assistive devices that you can get, um, like a magnifying glass um, or like a magnifier. They have some that are like, they can kind of prop up. It depends where you're kind of injecting. Um, it's hard to stay without kind of context, but if say you had to give yourself an injection in your arm, um, you could kind of position a, something to kind of help magnify it. Um, one thing that I use that's really helpful for like my physical pills is I use a dosset, which is kind of like a pill organizer. And so that is helpful because then if I, for, I, I don't have to open the, the bottles every time. So it saves my joints opening all the lids. Um, and you just kind of scoop them out. And then if you forget that if you took your meds or not, you can just check and the box is empty. So if it's empty, you took your medication. Um, but and same thing with inhalers. Yeah. Magnifying glasses would probably be the best thing, but it's hard to say without specifically seeing. Sorry. Um, thank you. Okay. So the next question, if you're feeling overly tired, is this an indication of a flare or is it just regular lupus symptoms? I'm new to lupus and was diagnosed a year ago in June. Um, I think that a flare 
um, can learning your flare symptoms are different kind of for everyone. So it's hard to say um, some people experience fatigue chronically, even when they aren't flaring um, with lupus. And some people um, only experience kind of that extreme fatigue when they are flaring. So it, sometimes keeping a track or a, a log of your symptoms to kind of track when you're feeling tired and if that's kind of correlating with your other symptoms can be a good indicator um, if being fatigued is a, is a trick or a sign of a flare for you. If that's helpful. And I just saw just before we get ahead, somebody asked up higher if um, managing everyday living at home counts as an occupation. And absolutely it does. Um, so even like managing a household, like say you work as a caregiver and, and you take care of your family or yourself and your household, that is still considered like productivity, even if you're not kind of like bringing in income, it's still occupying your time. Thank you. This next question might relate to the previous one. How do you differentiate between lupus fatigue and regular garden variety tiredness? Um, I think that the, the fact that even if you rest, you don't feel rested um, is kind of the, the different differentiation. So, you know, everybody, if you do a lot of activity, like a healthy person, if they do a lot of activity, they, they will feel tired. Or if they don't get a good night's sleep, they will feel tired. But it's kind of that, that disproportion of um, doing something that shouldn't be really exhausting for you. Maybe it's like a, a car ride. That's something that some people take for granted. But if that's really costing you a lot of focus because you're driving and you're, you're you know, in the same position for a long time or you're focused, um, I think that's kind of where the differentiation is. Like you're, you're not doing a lot of, say, physical output that some people would consider to make them tired. And it's you're still feeling um, that fatigue. Right. Like if you have to take a rest after a shower, right? Yes. Which wouldn't exactly. Typically... Exactly. And that's why I put that meme in there because it's so relatable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Just trying to find the next question. Lots of great comments here. Um, da, da, da. Lots of great comments. Oh, where is the Environmental Health Clinic Toronto? I'm in Ottawa. Um, Maybe this one. Oh, this was brought up in a previous comment that says a rheumatologist referred me to a sleep clinic, very helpful. And mm. I, be, I have fibromyalgia, I was referred to the Environmental Health Clinic at Women's, maybe that's Women's College Hospital. Uh, very helpful, the combination of medication from those two has sorted out my poor sleep significantly. I don't know, Abrielle, do you know which, um, do you know of the Environmental Health Clinic at Women's? Uh, I'll be honest, I live in Sarnia right now. Um, so I'm familiar with London, a little bit mm -hmm. Kitchener, Waterloo and Windsor. But um, unfortunately, I am not familiar with um, Toronto. Okay, no problem. Oh, so someone did answer at Women's College Hospital in Toronto. Okay. I hope that answers everyone's question. Okay, there are a lot of great comments here. Yeah. Um, just looking for, so participants might wanna read through the comments as well. Um, I'm having trouble finding useful and usable computer and other tech supports. I have a lot of dexterity and strength issues in my hands. Do you have any suggestions? Um, so there are different kinds of assistive um, things that you can do. So that's where like, you know how I put, uh, I'll go back maybe, but you know, checking emails or, you know, working on the computer, that typing, that's not just like mentally exhausting, it hurts your hands. 
Um, so you can get modified keyboards where um, they take less um, kind of pressure to, to, to press the key down. So you kind of just have to touch them. So then you, it, it can make that easier to type because you're not putting the, the pressure. Um, you can also um, get different kinds of mouse, mice, mouses um, that <laughs> are different grips um, so that they're in more natural positions. So if kind of holding your hand hurts your wrist in like a traditional mouse way, they have different ones that Unfortunately, you kind of just have to try to see what's best. You, and it's difficult because with COVID, it's hard to get out. Um, but yeah, I see in the, in the um, text here, there's also um, dictation software, talk to text. Um, Google Voice is a, a free one, like, or I think that's what it's called. Like the Google tech, talk to text is free. Um, and that, it's helpful. There's also like um, adaptive kind of aids that you can add to your computer. So you can get kind of like gel cushions to support your wrists when you're typing or um, different kind of like ergonomic keyboards that have more of a curve. So they're more comfortable. And yeah, I see here splints help a lot. Yeah, those are useful um, depending on the type of splint. If they are like hard splints, you can also get splints from occupational therapists, but um, if they're hard splints, it's hard to type in them depending on how they fit. But softer splints, um, even like wrist splints, like the soft ones for carpal tunnel and things like that, those can sometimes be helpful. And if um, we use if we use what we've learned today from Abrielle by planning our day, maybe we intersperse times that we need to be on our computer. If you have a job that allows that with time that you can be doing something else in your role or, or at home so that you're not, you know, on the computer for extended periods of time. And Google read and write. That's what, that's what it's called. Google read and write. It's free. And pain management is like a whole other OT topic too, but that would be like uh, a whole other webinar. Maybe <laughs> next one, Abigail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, um, I don't know if this actually, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted, someone is new to lupus and they were diagnosed, I guess, a year ago and they were a bit um, asking about being tired. I know it's really just a comment as well, but um, I, I, I think um, it's really important to point out, yeah, that uh, fatigue is, is I think, a, a huge part of lupus. Um, it could sometimes signify a flare, but um, in a lot of cases, it's just one of the, the things. Um, I'm speaking from my experience. I do have fatigue and it's something I have to deal with all the time. Even, you know, even when I'm not in a flare, I, I still have that high fatigue level. So um, just so you know, um, you know, it, you know, it's always good to check with your rheumatologist if you are not feeling well, uh, because you don't want to be in a flare and not realize you're in a flare. But fatigue is very much uh, a part of kind of living with lupus to some extent. And I think too, speaking to that, like, I know when I was first diagnosed, kind of grieving the loss of that health and not just being able to have all that energy and do all the things that you used to be able to do. So, you know, that is also an emotional adjustment, I think, to just know that all of a sudden you have new limitations for your body and you can kind of work with limits that you have, but you're still going to have, it is, it is a life altering, um, symptom, um, that you just kind of have to learn to manage. That's why they say like, there's no cure for lupus yet. Um, so. There was another comment that you might want to speak to um, that said, I find I get so far behind and overwhelmed just to get the basics done. I don't feel that I've earned the right to take time for fun. Oh, well, I think, um, pacing yourself to make that time for fun is really important part of balance. Um, but so, so it's maybe it's leaving the dishes for another day or, um, you know, sometimes like 
there's so many tips and tricks that sometimes come with experience, but making sure that you take care for, for fun, even if it's modified fun, um, is really important for overall health and wellness and for mental health. Um, so, you know, sometimes meal preparation, if takeout isn't an option, like that was kind of just the generic example. I saw somewhere that, you know, takeout has a cost. If you're, if you're on a budget, maybe it's dedicating your spoons on Sunday, instead of making one meal you for three spoons, maybe for four spoons, you make four meals and you use that, those meals and you put them in the fridge so that when you're kind of more tuckered out in the next couple of days, you have lunch or dinner. Um, so it's, that's what I mean about kind of planning and pacing for the basics. So if you're going to put in all the energy it takes to make food, because we need to eat and, you know, going out, takeout, I, I totally understand takeout is, can be so expensive if you eat takeout frequently. So that meal preparation piece, but again, planning it so that, okay, Sundays are like, for me, Sundays are my meal prep days. So I make all my lunches for the whole week because there is no way when I get home from work that I'm going to have time to energy to make dinner. I go home, I nap, and then maybe I, you know, do a little activity, but so it's about finding that balance for, um, what works best for you. Um, is there an assistive device to help put in eye drops? Speak of the devil. Um, so <laughs> this isn't an assistive device, but um, I also experience dry eyes and um, these ones soothe. They're preservative free eye drops. They're recommended by my ophthalmologist, but they come with this. This comes as part of it. I don't know if you can see. Um, so I'll even, I'll do a demonstration. Um, so, um, it's got this tab here. So I find it easier because you don't have to like squeeze it. You just push it. So you just put your thumb on it or you can, you could modify it. You could even use it with your wrist if your thumb's really sore and you could just kind of like, I haven't ever done it that way. So I'm not going to try right now, but, um, if you put your thumb and then you just push the bottom and basically you just kind of push it. I don't know if you saw that. It wasn't, I'll do this one. You just push it. So yeah, I recommend that works well for me. Great, thank you. Is there anything else, ladies? Um, and and are we? I, I know there's. Like I said, thank you, everyone. I, we have a great group tonight. Lots of participation, um, and a lot of uh, good uh, information. I, I really thank you for sharing because um, I think it's something we really appreciate. Um, in our support groups, and tonight I feel like we're almost in because everybody's just given really great. Um, great ideas and great support to each other here. So thank you so much. Uh, anything else, um, Rapinda or Joy? Just want to make sure we don't miss anything. Uh, I actually like have a question. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah. So, Abrielle, I, such a great talk. Thank you so much. Um, I just have one question, something that's been popping up in my mind um, throughout your talk because you spoke a lot about energy conservation and something that brings me a lot of joy and meaning in my life is actually exercise, specifically dance, which the whole point I guess is to expend energy. And I'm having a really hard time finding a balance because even though I do it recreationally, I still do it at like a, let's say like a pretty high level, but it's very hard to kind of maintain that level of physical fitness, um, particularly because I have a very physical job, so I work full time and then trying to find the energy to do that on the side. Sometimes I feel like I'm doing more harm than good when I'm exercising, even though generally exercise is recommended as part of a healthy lifestyle. Um, do you know like any strategies specifically for people with kind of like connective tissue disease type stuff for like, overcoming like muscle soreness, like improving recovery of joints and muscles after a workout, things like, or even 
like dietary things that can help kind of because I just yeah. I refuse to give it up <laughs> I don't want no to. <laughs> and honestly you shouldn't like yeah. I I totally understand like for me um I ride horses and that's my my joy too but again like if I'm exhausted sometimes like I can't go like it's just a reality um so I think that um exercise is such a huge part of wellness and maintaining you know muscle muscle mass and um also um joint health in general um to kind of prevent breakdown in joints like that that fluidity of um things and dance is is such a meaningful occupation um <laughs> So I think that um, there's a lot of different things. Like if you try to plan your day as much as you can, like I know you have to work, that's, you know, work. But in, in the other ways, like maybe um, making sure that you don't make dinner that night, like have a meal ready on the nights that you have danced. Um, I don't know how frequently you dance, that would kind of also come into, come into play. But um, one thing that I think is, meaning like that helps me uh and I, I that is in the re, in the literature is that um if you uh stretch um before and after like a, a lot of physical activity um before isn't as useful as after because once your muscles are like worked they actually stretch better which is kind of a misconception which is why I know everybody says yoga but it actually yoga is good because you warm up your muscles modified yoga that's another webinar but um, <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so uh, stretching is important diet protein hydration is so important um and even you could have a bath like epsom salts um after dance to try to it, it's hard to because then it's like do you modify your dance? It's hard to speak like specifically to that, but I hope that helps a little bit. No, those are really great suggestions. So hydrate, stretch after dance yeah. and Epsom salt bath. Yeah. And then modifying the days, like my day on the days that I do the dance. Mm -hmm. and, and even yeah. the day before too, like sometimes if you have like a huge social event, um, or like a really big commitment that, you know, like you're going to have to stay up late and you can't go to bed at nine 30, you, maybe you need to, um, you know, save your spoons and have an easy day the day before so that you can use them on the days that you have dance or things like that. And I saw yeah. somebody talk about arthritis life with Cheryl. I also love her, but I'm going to start posting things like life hacks like that on my Instagram too. I'm just like... <laughs> just starting but I promise those things are, are coming and if you have any feedback or you have anything specifically that you would like me to talk about on my blog or anything like that please reach out um do you yeah. want to put your blog information and your Instagram in the chat Abrea? sure I have it up on the screen here um, oh yeah yeah but I can also absolutely put it in the chat and um, somebody did ask how they can find an OT in their area. Yeah, so um, some of us work remotely. Um, like my practice is completely online. Um, and so other people, because of COVID, also kind of have that. So um, depending where you are in Canada, um, there's a website called the Ontario Society of Occupational Therapists. I can post that. And they, they have like a, a search lookup um, and they, um, yeah, and you can look up your area and it'll tell you, because not all occupational therapists specialize in kind of joint protection, energy, pain management, but um, yeah, Meals on Wheels, I see that's another good one. That's a great one. There's, there's so many in your community, like it's kind of niche to the or sometimes if there's like a I know in southwestern Ontario like Erie St. Clair Health Lynn they have like a website that you can search um yeah okay 
All right. right. Wow, that is a lot of information. Um, we're so glad and we will definitely have you back. Um, like you said, there's a whole different topics that uh, we can have you for. So uh, we'll definitely do that. And again, uh, I would like to thank everyone. Please visit uh, lupusontario.org for all our upcoming events, as well as uh, our support group uh, dates and time registration is all uh, available on Light at Lupus Ontario. Um, I would like to apologize. We do have our president, Linda Keel, on the call. And um, unfortunately, today was a little bit off. So I do apologize because we have just changed the way we're doing things uh, for our meetings. And um, so, Linda, um, I, I noticed you're there. If you'd like to say a, a hello to our group um, just before we close off for the evening. This is our president, Linda Keel. Yeah, yes. Oh, oh, right. Okay. There we okay. go. Okay. Sorry about that, Linda. Okay. Thanks, Sandra. Uh, okay. Thank you, Gabrielle, for a great presentation. That was really interesting. Uh, and I just wanted to thank everybody who signed in tonight. I know our last uh, webinar had some issues. And uh, as Sandra mentioned at the beginning, we've uh, taken a lot of uh, extra steps to um, make sure it doesn't happen again. And we really, really appreciate your confidence in us that we were able to put on a safe webinar. So I just wanna thank everybody um, who, who, who did sign in tonight. I'm sure you enjoyed the presentation, I did. And uh, we will just continue to try and improve uh, how we deliver our services to you, but I'm, I'm just so happy that we didn't have any unwanted visitors tonight. And by the way, we didn't expect to because we've had several support group meetings since we made the changes and haven't had any issues. So thank you for your confidence in us and uh, uh, look forward to seeing some of you at our November webinar. Okay. All right. So again, Abriel, we look forward to welcoming you again. Thank you so much, um, Lupa, uh, Lupus Ontario members, for your support, for your confidence in us. We do appreciate it. Thank you, Rapinda. Thank you, Joy, for uh, helping me out tonight uh, with the chat. Uh, there was a lot of information, so you guys were awesome. Thank you so much. And again, thank you so much, everyone. Hope you have a great evening. Um, Abigail, information was online, but if you do need um, additional information, um, please reach out to support at Lupus Ontario and I will get whatever questions or support you need. Um, if, you know, your question wasn't answered tonight or if there's something that you think of afterwards, if you can reach her directly um, as per her information that was there. But if not, you can reach me at support at lupusontario.org. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. And we look forward to seeing you in November for information uh, sem uh, seminar with our a very special guest we're gonna have from all the different organizations um, to help you deal with some of the other autoimmune conditions you might have as, uh, as well as your lupus. So thank you everyone, have a great night and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Abrielle. That was great. Thank you.